Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, everyone here. We have quite, a, quite a, a great number of attendees tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. And welcome to the Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. It's my very great pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Rachel Klima, the Applied Physics Lab of John Hopkins Uni Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Klima's educational background includes a Bachelor of Arts in 1997 in Geophysical Sciences from the University of Chicago, a Master of Science in 2003 from Earth and Environmental Science at the, from the University of Illinois at Chicago, a Master of Science again at, in Planetary Geology at Brown University, and a PhD in 2008 in Planetary Geology also from Brown University. Her research uses infrared reflection of rocks and minerals to study the geology of the moon and planets and other bodies of the solar system. We'll hear more about that in a moment. She's currently director of the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium and a senior staff scientist in the Planetary Exploration Group at APL. Rachel's been involved in a number of NASA missions, uh, currently serving as deputy principal investigator of the Lunar Trails Trailblazer Small Sat mission and as a co-investigator on the Europa Clipper. This fascinating Europa Clipper mission currently uh, to uh, intended to go to Jupiter's moon Europa is the topic of Rachel's talk tonight. This is the first mission focused on studying an ocean world beyond Earth. Rachel, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So um, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit first here. Um, it's, it's tough. I really like making eye contact with the audience and I can't do that here to see whether people are cringing as I talk, but um, I am, so as, as introduced, I'm a planetary geologist, a planetary scientist at uh, the Applied Physics Lab in Columbia, Maryland. I actually come from Chicago, um, grew up there, lived in Germany for a few years, um, and then came back to, Germ to uh, Chicago before um, ultimately moving out to Rhode Island to pursue a PhD in planetary geology. When I was a kid, I, I really loved rocks and I really loved space, but I had no idea there was an entire field of study that put the two of those together. Um, but I did actually have a, a kind of a circuitous trip to where I am now, which I think, um, you know, and I'm not sure where everyone is from here, but um, I enjoy talking about that and answering questions about it a little bit because I think it's important that people who are interested in space realize there's not just one way to get to the point of making a, a career out of studying uh, the planets or the stars or anything like that. I think you can take different turns. I personally went to um, community college after I graduated high school and thought I wanted to study foreign languages and anthropology and ended up discovering just how much I loved math and geology and starting to move into that. Um, then I transferred to University of Chicago and did all the stuff that was was in my intro. So um, there was also a period of time that I worked in between um, undergraduate and graduate school. Again, um, you know, not not the I came out of the womb wanting to be a planetary scientist and becoming one, but more of I found my pathway here and really found something that I loved. So um, I won't drag on about that too much, but uh, I just wanted to say a couple words about that. So now that I introduced a little bit about my background, let's talk about Europa and Europa's background. Um, Europa is one of the Galilean satellites of Jupiter, which means, uh, you know, these are the four extremely large moons around, around Jupiter that were discovered by Galileo in 1610. And that some of you may have been able to see with your own, uh, you know, even a binocular telescope in the last couple of months, um, I have, like many, probably uh, a little bit of a weird time dilation contraction thing going on right now since we've been living at home in the same environment for the last year. But sometime, very recently, um, we Jupiter was out in the sky with Saturn and um, there were a lot of really beautiful backyard um, home telescope images being taken where you could see the string of, of the Galilean satellites up against Jupiter and with Saturn right there in the image. Um, so of the Galilean satellites, the one that's closest to Jupiter is Io, of course, which is the only volcanically active body in the solar system outside of Earth. Um, Europa is kind of the, the smallest of the bunch, but um, has 
you know, was early noticed to have these dark markings that were very fascinating. Um, it's about 90% the size of our moon, so just a little bit smaller than Earth's moon. Um, whereas Ganymede, the largest of the Galilean satellites, is about one and a half times the size of the moon. So Ganymede and Europa both have um, icy shells with some of these kind of striping marks on them, whereas Callisto, which is again a little smaller than Ganymede, is more, uh, not quite traditionally pockmarked um, with craters as some of the, the um, things like the moon or Mercury, but has more clear craters visible on the surface like a lot of other bodies in the solar system which we don't really see a whole lot of on Europa. I'll get into those in more detail with better, better images soon. So some of our first really good images of Europa came back in 1979 with the flybys by Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And again, what was really distinctive about Europa were these dark streaks, and it really triggered a lot of um, excitement and interest in people's minds about what's going on. Like, why are the, there are these bands of, of dark material across the surface of Europa. And we got the really the first good views of those with the Galileo mission, which um, orbited the system and got images of uh, Europa and the other moons, uh, the other Galilean moons between 1995 and 2003. So most of the data that I'm gonna show you, um, essentially all of the data, I won't say all, because we do have some Hubble data, um, comes from Galileo and the images and other data that we got back from, from that lovely mission. So um, here you can see a better, a uh, little bit zoomed in, closer view of Europa's surface. And um, as, you know, as we start to look at it more closely, again, you can see that compared to something like the moon where you can see these um, craters you know, with a telescope, with binoculars, with your bare eyes, there's not a lot of craters on the surface. And when, when you study planetary geology um, and you think about this four and a half billion years of the solar system sitting around here in space with things flying around, craters are a very good way to figure out the age of something. And so, you know, right away, the lack of craters on Europa's surface makes one think, wow, this is really young. There's not a lot of, not a lot of objects have hit this in the recent past, which is really uh, quite fascinating and really hints at something being going on and the surface being more active and um, dynamic than a lot of what we see in the rest of the solar system, in much of the rest of the solar system. Um, now, over on the right-hand side of this image, I've got um, some more zoomed-in images of some of the different types of terrains, which I will kind of fly through in more detail in a, in a few slides, but they're um, just to kind of summarize them. There's these ridged plains. Um, there's the dark, the dark belts and bands that are down here in this one that's got titled lenticulae. The lenticulae are actually these little blobs that look like lentils. And it's not really exactly what lenticulae mean, means, but you know, these little things that look a little bit like, um, well, like little lentils or warts or something on the surface, um, a few craters, and then this terrain called chaos terrain, which is this jumbled, broken up surface that we'll talk about in more detail later. So really lots of cool, exciting, dynamic things going on with Europa's surface. Um, another thing that was learned by Galileo um, is that in addition to the, the geologic um, forms on the surface that hint that something is going on and the surface is dynamic and active. The, the shape of Europa changes because of this tidal pull. It's tidally locked with Jupiter, just like Earth's moon is locked with, with Earth, and it gets squeezed over time. And the amount that it gets squeezed as it goes past, like this video is showing, um, suggests that there's, it's not a, a fully rocky, solid, icy, solid body, that there's actually um, mush inside, essentially, that's being squeezed um, and allowing it to, to warp as it rotates around Jupiter. Um, another thing that's really exciting about Europa and also hints at this presence of an ocean is the fact that there's an induced magnetic field. So I'm not a um, magnetic fields person, uh, despite my 
starting my uh, undergraduate out as a physics major, but I will try to kind of explain this as best as I can. So uh, Jupiter, of course, has a magnetic field. Um, in the space around Europa, it, there's this induction that creates another magnetic field that goes around Europa. So there's like a separate magnetic field um, around Europa that's a part of this larger ma magnetic field around Jupiter. And the reason that this induced field is very likely there is again, because you have this liquid inside Europa that allows this other um, magnetic field to, to form. And um, so the, the lead of our uh, magnetometer team um, on Europa Clipper is actually the, the woman, Dr. Margaret Kibelson, who studied this and led this, um, this investigation on the Galileo mission. And that's her picture up in the corner. She's amazing. And it's one of the, one of the big thrills of working on this mission is getting to kind of bask in her wisdom. Um, she's over 90 years old and just absolutely amazing. Um, and this will be one of just a couple graphs that I put up, um, just to kind of give you an idea of the, the data parsing that needs to go in to understand some of the properties of the ocean of Europa. And uh, what, this, what this graph is showing is that by measuring, and part of what's really exciting about these magnetic fields is that by measuring the properties of the Jupiter magnetic field, and the properties of the magnetic field around Europa, basically you can figure out in this parameter space uh, where, where you live in the range of the depth of the ocean and the conductivity. And the conductivity here is related to how salty the ocean is. So basically, as you change the depth of the ocean and you change the saltiness of the ocean, you change the effects on both of these, or you change the effects on the Europa magnetic field. So by understanding the Jupiter, the Jovian magnetic field, and the magnetic field around Europa, we can start to zero in on where we are on this plot and say, okay, well, you know, if we are in this range, we've got an ocean depth, which we believe is around, uh, you know, so this is where we think we are, somewhere in this purple range. Um, we can pinpoint whether for a certain amount of salt, what the depth of the ocean might be. So basically a whole bunch of, um, all of these measurements go in together and can tell us both about the thickness of the ocean as well as about how salty the ocean is. So moving on, let me make sure this gets moving. Yeah. So let's get into the geology a little bit. Um, this is an image of one of the ridges on Europa, and this is going to zoom in as we go into some of the, um, the closer, higher resolution imagery that we have of Europa. Um, the Galileo spacecraft did get beautiful images of Europa, but just to give you a, a little teaser for how they compare to what we'll be getting on Europa Clipper, the global, um, the global map of Europa is about 500 meters per, or is, is at 500 meters per pixel. So that's half a kilometer, uh, per pixel. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's correct. The best the best global map. Um, the the high resolution images that you're going to be seeing here, the very highest resolution is eight meters per pixel, um, and most of the very high resolution images, which is only a handful of them, are about sixteen meters per pixel. So to give you an idea, kind of in reality, what you would be able to see on the surface of Europa at that kind of resolution, if you took my house, which is about fifty feet. Um, looking at the front, you that would be about a pixel. Okay, so my house on one of these images would be like a dark speck, not something that you would resolve. Um, when we start looking at the highest resolution on Europa Clipper, we would be able to resolve things like cars. Um, we're talking more like one meter per pixel at the highest resolution. So we're going to get we're really going to be able to delve into these areas in much, much better detail to understand um, what the surface looks like, both for science's sake and also for future missions 
that might potentially want to land on the surface in, in the future. So getting ahead of myself a little bit, but um, it's, it's pretty cool to think about just how well we're going to see the surface when we get there with Europa Clipper. So here is um, another landform type uh, that we have on Europa that are called bands. And these are these dark streaks that we've seen uh, with Voyager and then again with in much better resolution with Galileo. And what's really exciting about the bands, um, I'm going to play this little video here about how we think that they form, is um, we think that what's happening here is actually the, the surface kind of pulling apart. And so what's being simulated in this, in this um, model is what would happen as you're pulling apart and you're starting to fill in this warmer ice from beneath. And this warmer ice may be bringing up material that's from that's in the ocean. This may be one of the places where we can have communication between this ocean beneath the ice and the surface. So these bands are, are regions of uh, real interest to try to understand what's going on chemically in the oceans and whether this is something um, that points to potential habitability on Europa. So it's something like a bit like a spreading center at the mid-ocean ridge on Earth. So again, something that you don't see on any other planets um, in the solar system. I'm calling it a planet, it's pretty big. Um, planets or moons. All right, let me go ahead to the next, uh, the next slide here. Another thing that you see on Europa, which is uh, a little bit tougher to discern, and I'm gonna click again here so you can kind of highlight on the image where these subsumption zones are. But so these are regions that you can, I'll take it on and off a couple times, that you can see where um, it's lighter, lighter material in the images, but in as opposed to the spreading that we think is going on at the bands, this is a region where we think that these icy plates on Europa are getting jammed underneath one another. So um, like we have with plate tectonics on, on Earth. All right. Um, finally, here's a few images of impact structures on, on Europa. There's not a lot of these. Um, something that you'll notice with Tyre and Kalanish on the right is that there's a lot of consecutive of, of concentric rings um, in these, which you know we do see multi-ringed basins on the moon and on Mercury, but they're not, the rings are not this close and um, this many, <laughs> basically. So, you know, you, this kind of invokes the idea of a, a splashing in water or something like that. And that part of that is the, you know, the properties of impacting into ice. Uh, but they're also likely very, very young relative to what we see in large basins throughout the rest of the solar system, the rest of the rocky part of the solar system. All right. Ooh, I sure can talk. Well, we'll get through. We're almost through um, all of the background data about Europa. So this is what I do. So I study um, how infrared light re reacts with a, how it's reflected from a surface to understand the composition of the surface. So one of the, one of the really exciting things is that we can use this to understand the properties of different types of ice. So whether it's water ice, or ice with other um, molecules bonded into it, basically. Salty ice, um, dirty ice. We can understand that by looking at the way different wavelengths of light are reflected off the surface. Um, so what we do here on Earth is we study um, candidate materials in the laboratory, and we're able to use these to construct laboratories and to understand the physical principles of how the light reacts, uh, reflects off the surface in order to interpret what we see um, from the spectra off the, um, the surface of Europa. The other thing that we can do, and one of the instruments that I'll describe shortly, um, is essentially sniff, sniff the atmosphere and the, the, um, the surroundings of Europa to see what's being emitted um, from the surface. So um, I'll get into that in more detail shortly. But so here, basically that's how we can tell what's on the composition. So we can smell it or detect uh, the different molecules as they hit different types of sensors, or we can look at the way the light reacts, reflects off the surface in order to understand what's there. 
So, you know, basically after Galileo, a lot of the studies that went on really zeroed in on this idea that there must be beneath this cold, rigid layer of ice um, an ocean and that there's some communication between that ocean, you know, so we don't know the exact thickness of this ice, but we have all this evidence of disruption of the ice shell likely due to warm ice kind of flowing up um, like a lava lamp towards the surface and disrupting the surface. And again, what's really exciting about that is that means that whatever's going on in the ocean is somehow communicating with the surface and communicating with the surface in a way that we can go there and figure out what's going on. And we may be able to find evidence of any kind of organisms that could be living in that ocean. So um, one of the final types of terrains that I really find fascinating is this chaos terrain. And in chaos terrain, basically what's happened is the surface is jumbled up like a puzzle. So if you were to take this, and actually one, one of the first people I knew who ever studied Europa, um, this is what she did. She took images of the chaos and cut them up um, and pieced them back together to prove that you could make this back into a coherent surface that looked like the rest of Europa. So something was going on in this chaos where blocks of material were being shifted and twisted and messed up. Um, and there was a lot of debate that went on about, you know, does this mean that it has to be a very thin ice shell across all of Europa? But there's many areas where that's not, you know, there's evidence that that's not the case. So one of the more recent theories is that there's these lenses of water um, in the ice shell that allow this, these chaos uh, regions to develop above them. So you've got like these warmer bodies of, of, um, of water that are closer to the surface, um, feeding these chaotic uh, terrains on, on Europa. So um, I said we'd show something other than just Galileo data. This is data from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. And uh, there have been a couple of these studies now that have suggested that there are actually active plumes on Europa. They were detected both um, also by the magnetometer that, um, around um, Europa. There was a suggestion when they went back and looked at the data that there may be um, plumes um, that are active on Europa's surface and actually like jetting out material like we see on Enceladus. Um, this is something that we'll be able to test and we'll be looking for with the Europa Clipper mission. So I said we'd get back to this ingredients for life. Liquid water is clearly a really big one. Um, it's a really uh, key ingredient for everything that we know about habitability in life. Uh, but some of the other things that are really critical, and I, I saw that a lot of people also voted for the, the tidal heating. So this, you know, this energy, whether it's the tidal heating um, you know, this um, potentially heating from beneath um, through any kind of volcanic activity at the base of the ocean. Um, there's radiation coming in um, at the surface that provides an energy source. So we have like multiple sources of possible energy to feed life, although the radiation could also be damaging to life. So there's a balance there. Um, and We've got this ocean, and then again, beneath the ocean, we have this rocky um, part of the planet that we can't see, but we know is there and provides a lot of the fuel um, or the, the raw materials that um, can create, you know, react with the water to potentially um, provide fuel for life. All right. Very exciting place. So excited, it's gonna be so cool. All right, so on to Europa Clipper finally, after all that background. Um, Europa Clipper is a mission that is going to be launching in 2024 to go back to Europa with this an amazing payload that's really gonna probe all these questions that were discovered with Galileo. We're going to look at the ice shell and ocean. So, you know, of course, one of the main goals is to confirm that there's an ocean, to understand how deep it is, how salty it is, you know, is this hospitable to life or is it something that's just so salty that there's no way? Um, and to understand this potential communication between the surface and uh, the subsurface, whether it's these lenses of water 
or whether it's the ocean itself communicating directly um, with the surface. We have a payload, we have elements of the payload that focus on understanding the composition. So again, we're gonna look at reflected light um, to understand the composition of um, the ices and the non-ice materials on the surface. Um, we're also gonna have a couple sniffing instruments um, that will look at what's surrounding Europa, what's being ejected from Europa as particles hit it, as radiation uh, damages the surface, are things being freed up that can give you hints at what the composition is on in the ocean and beneath the ocean. And then finally, we're gonna have a fantastic high resolution camera to really understand what's going on with the geology. So the instruments on Europa Clipper basically break into these kind of uh, above, above Europa suite, Europa surface suite, and beneath the ocean suite. So um, first of all, I talked about the magnetic field. Um, we've got the magnetometer and the PIMS instrument, which are Faraday cups to understand the plasma environment. And again, that's um, understanding how Jupiter's magnetic field and Europa's magnetic field, distinguishing the two, understanding how, um, what they can tell us about the depth of the ocean and the salinity of the ocean. Um, the other instruments that really focus explicitly on material above the surface of Europa are the SUDA instrument, which is a dust analyzer, which basically um, will sit at the front of, you know, what, as you're flying across the surface, gets pelted by materials that are um, lofted from the surface of Europa, either by a plume or by just kind of impacts over time. So even though there's not a lot of giant um, crater forming impacts, there's still material and debris that's hitting the surface and material that's being um, lofted into the air that we can we can use to understand the composition. And that can directly understand the composition of that dust. And based on where we are on the surface, we can trace that back to see where it came from on the surface, which is really exciting. Finally, uh, we've got the mass spectrometer, MassFex, which is a highly sensitive spectrometer to understand the chemical elements, the organics that we're sniffing in the atmosphere um, whether we fly through a plume or we just start going across through the Europa exosphere, um, we'll be able to understand um, what, what um, organic material might be um, present in the atmosphere. So kind of at a transition is the Europa uh, UVS. So this is an ultraviolet spectrometer. This is going to be really a key instrument for understanding um, any plumes at the surface. So the, your ultraviolet um, imaging, we will look through uh, any kind of plumes as we fly over the surface and also look at the exosphere and be able to understand um, what kind of chemicals we're seeing in the surface, I mean, up above the surface. Uh, the ICE camera I talked about previously, but at the highest resolution images, it will be similar to some of the images you may have seen from the moon where you can see um, spacecraft and even astronaut tracks on the surface. So we'll really get fantastic images from that. Um, the MISE instrument is going to be the infrared spectrometer, which is looking at the reflected light off the surface. Um, and then um, finally, the Euthemus instrument is looking at the temperature of the surface. And so if we have things like hot spots under um, some of these regions like the chaos or the plumes, that will be able to detect them. Uh, finally, for looking beneath the icy surface, we have the Reason instrument, which is an ice penetrating radar. So it can actually see into the subsurface and start to map whether there's lenses of water um, and understand where there's a break between the icy layer and the ocean um, beneath the surface. So this is another way to get at the thickness of the ice shell. And then finally, it's a gravity experiment where we will look at the distortion of the, the shape of Europa and um, be able to understand more about um, the, the depth of the ocean again and uh, the nature of it. I saw a little red thing floating. I don't know if that's a, you're almost out of time or not, but I am um, gonna keep going unless somebody jumps in. 
So here is um, an image of the Europa Clipper spacecraft. And the way this mission is designed is that um, we do a series of flybys. So the flybys allow us to dip in and out of the high radiation environment around Jupiter and come back in, sweep across the surface, which I'm gonna just go ahead to the next slide and let this play to kind of give you an idea of how, um, how we do that and how we build up coverage. So we won't be orbiting Europa exactly. Um, we'll be passing by and by um, with closest approaches, kind of distributing themselves around, um, the, around Europa to build up an understanding of all of these things that I said we'd be looking at with the different payload instruments. So um, I have another video here again that I will that I will play that shows you in a little bit better detail how this will work. Um, so this is a, a actual plan basically for a candidate uh, tour, uh, one of the flybys in a candidate tour of Europa. And um, you will see the different instrument fields of view so that what they see on the surface, um, or in this case, they're seeing the surface and space around it. Um, so this is an actual plan of when we would turn things on and when we would turn things off and what they're seeing on the surface of Europa. You can also see how the lighting is from, from uh, the sun as we fly by. So a couple of the instruments, um, have to basically scan across Europa in order to collect their data. Uh, some of the others, like the ICE instrument, um, when it's gathering, it's, it, it can operate both with a frame where it like takes a snapshot, um, or it can sweep across and get color data of the surface. So we're getting closer, getting closer to the lit side, and you're gonna see a quick, like not in the face moment, where it looks like we're gonna crash, but we're not gonna crash. We're gonna fly over and then we're gonna relax and then we're gonna go by. And um, so, you know, these are something like five to six kilometers per second. Um, I think we're trying to stay under five actually uh, as we zoom past the, um, the moon. And that's because we have to be able to kind of track our motion in order to get clear images and be able to get the kind of pictures that we want out of it. Um, but we can do that with the, the instruments that we've got and the payload that we've got. So um, I said earlier, we're gonna be launching in 2024, uh, probably will be October, November of 2024. Um, and it will take us around five years to get there. We are really building stuff now. This is extremely exciting what, to be able to look at hardware for the, mission getting put together. Um, here's a couple of the, the um, big elements of the flight system that have been built and you can see them being put together. And we've also got um, payload instruments uh, coming together. There are some of the um, elements of the payload and, and elements of the elements of the, of the payload instruments and their um, models little show and tell. And finally, here's our team. Um, I'm on the project science team. I'm actually not a, a co-I, I'm a project staff scientist. Um, we have about 130, a little bit over 130 people on the team. Um, really wonderful, wonderful group of people, international scientists. Um, most of the team is co-I's, but we've got a, you know, a handful of us on the project science team as well that are helping to do things like make sure that the paperwork's in order to make sure the requirements are met and that we know how to prove to ourselves that the requirements are being met, those kind of things. So I can leave it with that. Um, let me look at the time. Unless, unless somebody wants me to go through one more little thing. Or how are we doing on questions? We have, well, questions. Well, yeah, let's, we have a variety of questions. Why don't you leave the slides up while we start on the questions? So that way, if you want to go back to any of them, you can. Okay. And then this way I can leave the, uh, the web address on here. Yeah, I saw the little orange pop-up. So let's see. Uh, was anything in the chat to me? Um, the first one that's in the chat was, how did Europa get so much water? 
Well, so, you know, it's interesting. Ah, I want to stay on this one. Um, if you look at how the solar system formed, what's actually more amazing is how we got so much water. Um, so if you think about uh, early solar system, so you've got this ball of stuff swirling around the sun, the lighter elements and the more volatile elements don't start to form into solids until you get further away from the sun. So there's something that's known as the ice line, which is about, it's partway through the asteroid belt. And that's where, or the snow line or the ice line, and that's where we expect to start finding icy bodies. Um, the Earth and Mars and Venus and Mercury are all well inside of that ice line or snow line. Um, so, you know, we had to have big objects probably loaded with water delivered to us probably after our original planet formed, whereas Europa um, did form beyond this ice line. Now, the water itself, again, I think this is, you know, this is part of its tidal stresses that are keeping that ice liquid um, rather than letting it flow, freeze into a solid ball like we've got at Callisto. Um, Ganymede has maybe got a little bit of ocean. Hopefully that answers that question. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Klima. Next question, I understand that Juno mission has been extended. With this additional time, Juno will focus its attention to the Jovian moon, moons and their electromagnetic fields. Are there any specific investigations that Juno will conduct that are intended to help planning for the Clipper mission? This is from Wayne. Oh, um, this is a, a great, a great question. And one of the big things that Juno's really helping us out with um, practically is understanding the radiation environment because, you know, the, the biggest risk of this mission and why we are, like I said, a flyby mission rather than an orbiter is that we, we don't want to hang around in that radiative environment too long because it puts stress on um, all of the instruments, all of the elements of the spacecraft. And so the better we can understand just how damaging or not damaging that that field is, um, the better we can kind of um, plan our trajectories and understand, oh, you know what? We could probably get 10 more flybys in while the spacecraft is still fine or that while these instruments are still functioning um, you know, at peak performance. So, you know, that that would be like right now, the biggest communication we've been having with Juno has been about that. But, um, you know, we're definitely working with that team to get any kind of advanced understanding that we can to make Europa Clipper a better, stronger, more uh, robust mission. Okay, and while we're speaking of flybys, can, can we have access to the plan which visualize the flybys? Um, access to the plant, so like that little video? Um, can we access the plan which visualize the flybys? So is it public information? Um, have access to that information? Probably not. Um, so I will, I, I, I don't think that that's provided as public information. Um, and actually, the plans that we have are all kind of notional plans right now anyway, because we don't have um, the exact parameters on, um, we haven't designed our final trajectory yet, basically. But um, so, I mean, if you're asking for the trajectory data, um, again, I mean, I can ask, but I don't think that that's something that they're publicly sharing right now. Okay. Um, has a decision been made about the launch vehicle, SLA? L, L, I mean, excuse me, S, L, S, <laughs> or something smaller, excuse me. Um, so as was publicized a few months ago, we are no longer legally bound to launch on SLS. And um, there will probably be, if, if there isn't already something in the news, there will be something very soon. But basically there is, um, I was nervous about this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, commercial vehicles are very, very, very much on the table. Um, so, you know, there's uh, SLS is going to be really necessary for a lot of the return to the moon 
uh, efforts. So you know we are we are no longer bound to that, and we're able to um, to you you have them. options, and people should stay tuned. Yes, you have options, and people should yeah. stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Which of the which of the Clippers instruments will best augment your research? Definitely MISE. So the uh, the imaging spectrometer. I imaging spectrometers are fantastic instruments because they are able not only do they tell you about like what the composition is of a single spot but they create an entire image across the surface where you can take those data and dig into any little piece that you can see visually so you can look at a single um spectra like a, a single wavelength of that and you get, you get something that looks like a photograph and so you could look at that and say, all right, here's a band, here's the center of the band on this. Now I'm gonna look in another dimension across the, in the spectral plane and understand what the composition at that spot is relative to other spots in that image. So um, that's what I'm really excited about, about looking at because having that spatial, um, spatial and compositional information together to understand what materials we're seeing at the surface is going to be dy fantastic dynamite all kinds that, of cool. i'm going to uh break in for a second we've got some people entering questions in the chat if everyone would mind please entering them in the q a so that way they're in order and i'm going to go ahead and share one of the questions from the chat now um because there, there there's a lot of them that's great uh so uh <laughs> there was a question here um do you know whether perhaps uh a european space agency or nasa might be planning to put any sort of a lander on board the clipper um so we won't have a lander on clipper and um there was sort of you know so there's a lot of desire to land on Europa, but you know, as I showed you with a lot of these images, it's a very rugged, you know, despite not having a ton of craters, the way that these bands go across the surface, the chaos on the surface, we don't know when you start to look at this at a one meter per pixel scale, you know, if you were to park your car on the surface, are you gonna fall in a crevasse instantly? Or are, are there flat, nice places to land, you know? so. The reconnaissance that you really need to be able to put a lander on the surface of Europa needs to be done at a higher resolution before we put a bunch of money into designing a, you know, a multi-billion dollar lander. So, you know, but Europa Clipper will get the kind of data that we need to understand that. So, you know, with a follow-up mission, whether it's from ESA or from um, NASA, we'll, we'll have the understanding of at least some, uh, targeted portions of Europa about, you know, what kind of, how we'd have to design the lander to deal with, um, with the terrain and where we'd want to go. Hopefully that answered that question. Christine, do you have another one to follow? You um, want to switch back with me? Um, let's, uh, let me do one final one from the chat and then, okay. and then Shirelle, you take care of the ones in the Q and A section. So one final one from the chat here is, okay. uh, will the spacecraft be able to see the flexing of Europa? And if so, how big of a movement is that expected to be? Is that like a hundred feet? What sort of flexing Ooh, might we be able to I see of Europa from the, from the spacecraft? That's a tough one that I'm sure someone could answer in, well, I can answer and, um, and I can tell you yeah. that some of your colleagues are actually online too. If you, if uh, uh, okay. we, we had an earlier message um, uh, from someone saying that some of the Clipper, uh, some of the other Clipper folks are here with us too. So oh, that's excellent. If, if any of them want to uh, put something in the chat box, Zachary Lupin said that a handful of tonight's attendees are JPLers working on the Reason instrument. So, okay. If, well, so the the easy answer is that we we should be able to see this, but it's going to be challenging. So. Um, we are looking at the detailed shape of the surface. Um, so it's, we won't see it like that video. We won't see it going squish, squish, squish. But we will be able to, so we're going to be imaging the limb and looking at the, the shape of the, of, I keep wanting to call it a planet and I do it with the moon as well, but um, <laughs> the shape of Europa. Um, and we will, will be able to detect it. Um, and I, as far as the exact scale of it, it, it will be within our resolution to, to tell the difference. 
Um, but I can't tell you whether that's hundreds of meters or kilometers. Maybe some, hopefully someone in the chat can do it. Can you do it for me? But yes, yeah, so you know that will be something. Now, the, the other thing is in order to get this network and to build up a really um, good understanding of the shape of Europa, basically we're gonna be taking these images that we get. We need images as a, at a certain resolution and we need them across the right parts of Europa. So when you look uh, back at the web that we're building up, um, we're gonna basically, you need to go around it twice. Um, and intersect somehow. So you could get like two bands that cross each other, or you could get two bands that don't cross each other, but then a connector of images between them to be able to really constrain the full shape of the surface. So we'll be able to do it, but it won't be like super straightforward. All right, another question from Q&A. What's the potential hill zone of Europa? The potential, what's that? Hill zone, hill zone. Oh, that I don't know the answer to. So that's the range at which we expect other stuff to be around it, right? Um, I unfortunately cannot answer that one. All righty, no problem at all. I think that, you know, don't know the <laughs> best to say you don't I know. can look it up though. So if you want to email me. <laughs> I, I can get you that answer, but I will. I don't want to even take a guess. Um, no, it's quite, yeah. <laughs> quite fine. Um, if the launch is in November 2024, when is when is the arrival? Is there a timeline available? Um, let's see. It's like five and a half years, so 2029, 20, 2030 ish. Okay, fair enough. So um, how long? Go ahead. Well, just. You know, a lot of things that they're they're going to optimize are in the trajectory. We can do things like we're going to be doing a Mars flyby, um, probably, um, in order to get there and to shave some time off of the 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 trip out there. Um, with SLS, we would go direct, but with a commercial vehicle, you have to use some gravity assists. And one of the things we want to do is try to keep those. Um, you know we have to design the spacecraft for the radiation environment at Europa and the thermal, the temperature environment at Europa. So if we can keep most of our movement outside of, like between Earth and Europa, it's a lot easier on the spacecraft than if we did something complicated where we used Venus as a flyby um, target, which is possible, um, but we're trying to avoid something like that because then you get a much hotter environment than you're gonna experience any other time and you have to design your instruments and your your uh, flight system to handle that so okay speaking um, of the heat um i this mr dan roy said i assume that the radiation of europa is not as bad as for juno but it is bad enough what has been done to handle it well so we have one of the main ways that they're um, protecting against that is that the more sensitive elements of the payload are in the vault basically so they're in a shielded area, so we've got electronics and whatnot that can be in the vault are in that. Um, so that helps to minimize the radiation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of testing to make sure that all your components are hardened against radiation and can survive the environment. So that's you know where a lot of the development has gone in is making sure that we've got um, detectors and other things that can survive um, sitting out there and and dipping in and out of this high radiation environment. Okay, if Europa is expanding and shrinking, is there any evidence of shrinkage like Mercury? Um, there's, you know, we have all of this activity going on where there's like, you know, maybe these subsumption zones where there's kind of shrinky spots, but it's not like with Mercury where we have, so it's it's flexure at Europa, right? So it's this tidal squishing. It's not like global contraction across the entire surface like we have on Mercury when it cooled and we formed the wrinkle ridges. So, um, you know, there are kind of localized regions where you see um, kind, of, kind of shrinkage, but you don't have um, that dominating the global um, 
tectonic environment the way that you do with the wrinkle ridges on Mercury. All right, and this question is about the um, Clippers instrument. Will there be instrument to analyze the gases that's coming out of Europa? Right. Um, yes. So that's uh, the mass specs instrument is the one that's going to be analyzing, like actually sniffing those materials that are coming out. So whether we fly through a plume or if there's uh, just gases in the exosphere. Um, the SUDA instrument will look at particles in that environment. So things that are a little bit bigger um, will be sensed by SUDA. And both of those are instruments that will like fly through it basically and just boom, they hit the hit the detectors. Um, and then we'll also look at the gas emissions with the UVS, uh, Europa UVS instruments. So that will kind of look through any gases um, and detect, you know, whether you've got emission lines from, um, you know, oxygen or whatever, whatever materials that we're seeing in the exosphere. All right, Christine, you have some in the chat box that you want to ask? I think that's all the questions from the chat box and we only have just a couple minutes left. So I would say if there are any que other questions in the Q&A that you would like to answer now, I, there's quite a few of them here, so. Right, I will go through um, the last two that are here. Is there evidence of tectonic activity powering other geologic features, which are plumes similar to the Earth's plate tectonic subduction zones? Yeah, so that's those couple that I showed, the subsumption zones, which I can probably, I don't know if I can get back to it quickly enough, but um, I'm going to try this here. Um, the, the closest thing to something that's like a subduction zone is these regions here um, where, whoop, I was trying to, let's see if I can do it going that way. No. All right. Well, they're kind of covered here, but there are these regions where, um, it's it's as if the plates are coming together and there's there's material being lost from what we can tell. So at the bands we see material being gained, and at the subsumption zones we see loss of um, loss of material, like as something similar to subduction, um, but kind of just getting crumbled in there, in a in an icy way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Klima. Sherelle, would you like to do the closing polls? I know that we're running out of time and people have other places to be and other things to do. And uh, we've got some great <laughs> questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Klima, for your presentation. And we will go ahead and launch the fourth poll. So go ahead and start answering. Here we go. There are two questions to be answered. Please and thank you. And yay, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Ah! Europa Clipper. So, Dr. Klima, which object in the solar system is secretly your favorite? Oh, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> that is very dangerous. <laughs> okay, do you have a category of objects that are your favorites? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> There's. Could, could you say that moons in general are your favorites? Um. Well, okay. <laughs> I my heart uh -huh. will always be with Mercury as my oh. heart. Um. But I love our moon. I love Europa. Is so fascinating. And you know, I mean, I like one of the first places I ever really dreamed about as a kid because I was a big fan of uh, 2001. It was one of the first movies that I saw on a videotape when I was a kid. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I love the books. So, you know, Europa has always absolutely fascinated me. But, you know, through my PhD, I worked on rocky bodies and, um, uh, yeah. And, you know, the composition of rocky bodies. So, of course, um, fascinating. All the volcanism and everything else there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I love them all. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and thank you so much for your questions with phenomenal questions asked tonight. Um, we will do some magic on the recording and make sure that it's uploaded to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Dr. Klima, for all of your hard work on the presentation. Thank you everyone for your questions and attending. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.
And I'll look up the hill question for someone, whoever that was. If you want to email me, I'll find oh. you. An answer. <laughs> well, uh, all right. I love your tenacity. And thank you also, Christine, for your help and Dr. Gaddis as well. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. Thank you.